Welcome to the book of Nahum. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck is that? This is actually one of the books in the Old Testament. Uh, it's one that doesn't get talked a lot about in here. Uh, we don't know a ton about Nahum, but uh, we're, we're going to learn some fun things today. But he has some really good insight for Latter-day prophecy uh, as well as for his day. So it's a short book, but uh, some interesting things we're going to learn today. Now his name, Nahum, means consoler, basically. So that can give you an idea of what kind of things we're going to learn from him. Nahum was a bit of a poet, and so we're going to get some, a little bit of like the poetry, kind of poetic understanding of what's going on and some of the prophecy and revelation that he was given as well. Uh, in fact, let's see, this is from Elias C. Rasmussen's Nahum, a poet prophet uh, from the instructor in 1962. He says that Nahum was a poet. When he saw in vision the end of Assyria, he poured forth in unrestrained and picturesque Hebrew the relief felt by his people. In many ways, his poetry vents the wrath, sighs the relief, and bespeaks the hope of all who have been oppressed when the oppressions at last have ceased, and the oppressor is no more. But Nahum was also a prophet, and he saw in Assyria's downfall an example of the hand of God in justice, reaping with a vengeance all the enemies of good. While he preserves in mercy and with patience those who try to do good, envisioning the over overthrow of this cruel and mighty empire whose kings in their own records boast of the captives they have maimed, the realms they have subjected and the treasures they have confiscated, Nahum tells how the doom of the mighty and the wicked is decreed deserved and done. His book begins with an acrostic with one strophe or stanza for each of the first 15 letters of the Hebrew alphabet with two alterations of the sequence. The first seven strophes verses two through five in English emphasize God's power over nature and over his enemies. But the third, which is verse three, interrupts to tell of his goodness and justice. The second seven strophes emphasize his power over all enemies and evils, but again tells by contrast in the third of the series, around verse 7, of his goodness and his mercy to those who take refuge in him. The fifteenth and final strophe, which is about verse 10, provides a summary and a transition to the next subject to be treated, the castigation of Nineveh. Assyria and Judah are alternately addressed in the next poem, which is verses 11 through 14. The one is to be punished and the other to be redeemed. It concludes with a hopeful verse speaking of a peaceful age in terms that seem to herald the messianic age when all oppressors shall have ceased. So that just gives you kind of an overview of what Nahum's about. So hopefully you're looking at this going, hmm, this Nahum guy sounds pretty cool. He's a poet. He's coming at a time where we are uh, dealing with the soon downfall of Assyria and the things that will happen with that, which is important for us to look at, especially uh, for uh, LDS philosophy, because in the Book of Mormon, we are told in the beginning of the Book of Mormon, 1st and 2nd Nephi, that the downfall of Assyria and Babylon are a sign of the destruction of the wicked in the last days. So Nahum's going to give us some insight to help us in understanding that better through his poetry. Now timing Nahum is a little bit of a challenge just because we don't know enough about him, but because of his writings we know what was going on around him basically. So Sidney Sperry in his book uh, The Voice of Israel's Prophet said this about Nahum. He said, the date of Nahum's activities has to be deduced from certain statements made in prophecy. In chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, references made to the destruction of the city of Noaman, the uh, Egyptian Thebes, as an already accomplished fact. We know Thebes was captured by Ashurbanipal the Assyrian in 663 BC. Therefore, Nahum's prophecy must have been written after that date. And since Nahum's prophecy deals with the coming destruction of Nineveh, we know it must have been written before 612 BC, the date of her downfall. We may date Nahum's ministry with some degree of probability. Therefore, between the years 663 and 612 BC, 
that's probably when it happened, when Nahum was around. So this is before the Book of Mormon, before Lehi and, and uh, his family does things. So this is probably the time Jeremiah is around as well, doing things or, or uh, in that, that time frame, maybe just at the very beginning or even just a little precursor ahead of Jeremiah. So some interesting things to kind of see where he's positioned and what he's going to see. Uh, so let's jump into the chapter one, basically, of the book of Nahum. So verse one, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the El Elkoshite. Now the word burden is used to render the Hebrew masa may be taken to mean both a lifting up, like lifting up of your voice, utterance, oracle, and a heavy lot or fate. That's from the uh, Oxford uh, English Dictionary. Um, now the capital of Assyria is uh, is Nineveh. That's the main capital. We talked about that during the uh, discussion in the book of Jonah. Uh, so this is again where Jonah went, and they listened to him according to his story, and they repented. So maybe at a later time, they a different king. Maybe they went back into wickedness. We see this even with Israel sometimes flipping back and forth. So at this point, they're the enemy of Israel. They are cap. They've captured Israel. Uh, they have taken the northern tribes. Uh, so we're, if you think about it, we're almost getting into the time uh, when uh, Babylon's going to come through. That's six, around 612 BC is when Nineveh falls to Babylon and the Persians, basically. So <clears throat> that's, that's the time frame, basically. So this is kind of after Isaiah and just before Jeremiah time period, basically. Now, Verse 2, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. So inside this poetry, we see a series of messages of God's anger and power. Then we see God's mercy, a good reminder to look for the mercy of God amid the challenges of life. So that's what we see in verse 2 here is kind of that idea. God is jealous, the Lord revengeth. Now, another way to think about God being jealous is that he is fiercely loyal to his friends, the people that are worshiping him, his, his, his children, the people of Zion, basically. Um, so that's, that's another way to look at this. It's not that God is, if you think about this idea as like God is jealous from a standpoint of what we think of mortal jealousy uh, is probably not the most accurate way to look at that, more of He's loyal to his people, and he did say he would save his people at some point from Assyria. And so maybe that, that the tides are turning, and he's going, okay, Assyria's done their job. It's time to let them out. Let, let's get, it's time for Assyria. It's lived its purpose. It's time to go. Now, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. So remember, God is jealous or fiercely loyal and slow to anger. Some qualities of God are coming forward in this verse, uh, which is interesting because if you think about it, being jealous and slow to anger sometimes feels like a paradox. You know, that's uh, how can you be slow to anger but also be jealous? If you think in more worldly terms, that almost sounds like a big contradiction. Uh, but if you think of the ideas from the standpoint of fiercely loyal and slow to anger, he's got patience and concern for his people. Uh, the Let's see, verse 4, He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. So Bashan is, we know, these places like Bashan, Carmel, they have a lot of oak trees and abundant pasture. So this is, in verse 4, we're talking about this idea that God is the God of the world, the natural God. All, the na all of nature follows him. Remember, in this time frame in ancient worlds, uh, polytheism was a common philosophy to use. And so they believed that there was a God for each different factor of nature rather than one God that takes that takes care of all of it, that can do all the things, basically. 
that's kind of this idea in verse four is building him up. You know, God controls all of nature. In verse five, the mountains quake at him, the hills melt, the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. That's that same idea, basically, that uh, God is the one. There's one God and he controls all of it. Verse six, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. So even though he's slow to anger, when he does finally get angry, it's a doozy. It's, it's, you don't want to be around when that's, when that's happening. Uh, so a good reminder for all of us, let's, let's be uh, on the good side of God so we don't get uh, destroyed. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. So the Lord is upset, and he is good. Basically, so he's he is upset with the people, with the wickedness and sin. But he's also good for those who are, for those who worship him. Basically, are following him. He is a blessing for them. Uh, verse eight. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end to the place of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. So when you look at this again, there's this contrast. He's good to those who are good. He's not so good to those who are bad, basically. Verse 9, what do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So what do you imagine God to be like? Is kind of an interesting question to think about at that point. You know, what's, he's the all-powerful God, basically. In fact, it's interesting when they use the word Lord, I've uh, heard that oftentimes they use in place of the word Lord was actually used to be the word Jehovah uh, or the Yahweh, basically. And uh, they change it to Lord to not have it used as often. But most of the time it's talking about Yahweh in uh, the scriptures in the Old Testament when they use the word Lord. Uh, so just kind of interesting thoughts you know, as you go through the scriptures and see that. <clears throat> so verse 10 for while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. When stubble is fully dry, it's the height of summer, it's hot, got that hot air, everything's dried out. It doesn't take much. And it's all bunched together, it's all pulled together. Like this is the people are inebriated, they are not paying attention, they're not about their don't have their wits about them. They don't realize the problems that they're about to step into. And it just takes off like wildfire. Stubble burns quick when it's hot and dry. It moves really fast. Uh, so that's the challenge there is it's all, when, when the destruction comes, it's going to come quick. Verse 11, there is one come out of thee and imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So this is interesting. The Old Testament study manual had a comment on this when they said, still prophesying of Judah's future, Nahum spoke of one very wicked counselor whose yoke upon Judah, probably a large yearly tribute, was to be broken. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had invaded Judah with a force of nearly 200,000 men. The prophecy foretold that Sennacherib would die shortly and the house of his gods would become his grave. While he was worshiping in the temple dedicated to the god Nisroch, Sennacherib's two sons, Adram, Adramelech and Sherezer, Shereze, murdered their father as Nahum had prophesied. So we hear about that story in 2 Kings chapter 19. Um, so he's probably the one that fulfills verse 11, basically this idea of a wicked counselor. That's Sennacherib, king of Assyria, that has come down against Israel. Verse 12, thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down. When he shall pass through, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. So God is going to help the people now that they've experienced the, basically the results of their decision. If you go back and look at the, what we talked about with Isaiah, with all the past prophets, the people had gone wicked, they weren't repenting of their sins. They weren't 
letting the atonement take care of it, basically. They weren't coming back to God on their own. So God could not stop justice from doing its thing and punishing the people. They got punished, and now they're getting to the other side of that punishment where it's like, oh, okay, punishment's enough. Justice has been met. It's time to move forward. Verse 13, for now will I break his yoke from off thee, meaning Israel, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. So get rid of the bonds, get them, Israel, out of bondage to Assyria. Uh, verse 14, And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. So Assyria, a commandment concerning Assyria, that no more of thy name be sown, meaning no posterity. Uh, out of the days of, out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and molten image. I will make thy grave for thou art vile. Remember we talked about that for 2 Kings 19, that uh, Sennacherib's sons conspired and murdered him while he was at the temple of his idol, basically. Uh, verse 15, Upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no, no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Now verse 15 is an important one. We sometimes see in this one, Ideas of the of a restoration. LES culture sees that a lot in verse 15. Um, but we can also see this in the idea of Judah has not been captured yet. In uh, Sometimes in Jeremiah, Judah is seen as the younger sister. Israel was the older sister and should have known better, but then got, you know, got destroyed by Assyria. Judah is the sister that hasn't been destroyed. And uh, if you remember, the, Assyria did lay siege to Judah. But uh, Hezekiah got the people to pray and fast, and God slew most of the Assyrian army overnight. Uh, so they left and didn't come back against Judah themselves in Jerusalem. So this is, could be seen also as a warning of telling Judah, hey, this is a good time. You're going to be taken, you know, Assyria is going to go away. You're not going to have the Assyrians overseeing you as far as like you have to pay tributes to them. But you also need to realize that you still need to repent and don't go down that road that your older sister did, the Northern Kingdom did, basically. So let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue the book of Nahum.